What is the impact of anti-discrimination laws on American society? Join Richard Ebelin and me in this week's Libertarian Angle as we examine that question. Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, and this is this week's issue of the Libertarian Angle, the show that you all know brings you the principled case for the libertarian philosophy. I'm joined by my co-host, Richard Ebeling, who teaches economics at the Citadel. Richard, good to see you again for another round of Libertarian Angle. Always, it's good to see you and to be with our viewers and listeners. Yeah, nice to have you all back. And if you're brand new to the Future of Freedom Foundation and you're seeing this video for the first time, uh, come and visit us at FFF.org for 34 years of principled, uncompromising libertarian principles. So, Richard, there's an issue that we haven't addressed in a very long time and that we addressed a very long time ago that I thought it's time to come back and revisit. In our very first year, October 1990, of course, you were writing for FFF. You were vice president of academic affairs for FFF at that time. And uh, both of us were writing articles, both in our monthly journal, Future of Freedom, which at that time was called Freedom Daily. And we were also doing extra articles. But in October 1990, we addressed anti-discrimination laws. I mean, this is this show, shows you that this principled application of libertarian principles uh, is not anything new here at the Future of Freedom Foundation. And as I recall, um, my article was called "Racism, Control, and Rock and Roll," and yours was called. Uh, do you remember? Uh, I think it was race and discrimination, something like that. Yeah, race in the market process. Uh, race in the market process. Okay. And then we also, I'm looking at it now, the table of contents on our website for October 1990. We had a, a piece by F.A. Harper, who founded the Institute for Humane Studies and who had been at the Foundation for Economic Education. And his essay was called Discrimination. And then we included a book review that you wrote on a Thomas Sowell book called Preferential Policies. Right. So the issue, Richard, is really should people in a free society have the, the right to discriminate on, on any basis? And, of course, our argument is absolutely that, that an essential part of a free society is the principle of freedom of association. And freedom of association means that you can discriminate against people on whatever reason you want, uh, that you don't have to be forced to associate with people that you don't want to be associated with. Now, with respect to government, I think we would both agree that government doesn't have this prerogative. Government has to have, maintain a strictly non-discriminatory policy in terms of race, color, creed, national origin, religion, what have you. But with respect to the private sector, freedom of association entails the right to decide who you're going to associate with. So um, we've all come to accept that with respect to our homes. I mean, it's just, it's just normal. Nobody even questions the fact that you have a right to discriminate against anybody that comes into your home on any basis you want. If you have a party consisting of, you know, 200 people in your backyard you don't have to have any Jews, Catholics, uh, Mexicans, uh, foreign citizens, um, Blacks, uh, Asians. You can have just nothing but pure white Anglo-Saxon Protestants in your house. And nobody questions that. It's just it's sort of like a normal part of life. It, that that's your right as part of freedom of association by the same token. A dinner party of Jews doesn't have to to uh, invite Catholics. It's it's their right. Uh, we also see this in the area of country clubs. You know, country clubs, a lot of people may not realize, uh, they have the right to discriminate on any basis they want, race, color, creed, or whatever. And some of them did. They would discriminate against blacks or Jews or whatever. But what ultimately happened there is that they got nudged into some proper behavior that people said, well, I don't want to have anything to do with that country club then. And as they saw their membership dropping and they saw social ostracism being imposed on them, a lot of these country clubs said, you know, if we're going to survive. We need to get rid of our discriminatory policies. But that's how freedom works and how a free market works is it, it nudges people to proper behavior. So the, the real 
quirk in all this was private businesses. And the uh, when you had segregation laws in the South, these these abhorrent laws that that required people to separate on the basis of race, most of the time they would apply to businesses, private businesses, and the law held, oh well, they're different because they're opening their themselves up to the public. Well, my argument is pure nonsense. These are privately owned institutions, and that. That, that what they should have done was simply get rid of segregation laws. In other words, get rid of laws that mandated the separation of races, let private businesses decide for themselves. But they didn't do that. They, they, the feds use this as an opportunity for power. And they said, we're now going to require integration, forced integration. So you go from forced segregation to now forced integration. And there, in my opinion, was the real heart of the problem, that, that all of a sudden you're, you're coming down with, with the force of the state, uh, interfering with private property rights, and destroying freedom of association. Because if a private business says, we don't want to associate, we don't want customers that are Jews, Catholics, Italians, Blacks, uh, whatever, that's their right, just like they do with their home. And that if that had been left to be the case, in other words, protect freedom of association with respect to commercial establishments that are privately owned, they would have ultimately been pushed or nudged in the right direction, just like the, it is with, uh, with country clubs. Uh, but at the same time, you would have been protecting freedom of association. And that was essentially the, the thrust of my article that I wrote back in 1990. I was, I was showing uh, that in the, in the area of rock and roll, Rock and roll was bringing the races together, young people together, all voluntarily. And uh, it, it shows you that the marketplace will break down racial barriers if you just let the marketplace work. What do you think, Richie? Well, I'd like to start with the more general one that you were alluding to, and that is we all discriminate. Uh, we discriminate in the friends we choose. Uh, we discriminate in the clothes we wear. We discriminate in the places we choose to uh, buy goods and services. Um, I like to read economics, history, um, philosophy, not as much as I used to, uh, and so on. But I discriminate against a lot of authors who I choose not to buy and therefore read their books uh, in the marketplace. Um, I don't read sci-fi novels. Uh, I'm not interested in romance Harlequin novels. Uh, I'm not interested in uh, uh, sort of horror novels. Uh, and therefore, I am financially affecting every author who I choose not to associate with by purchasing their book. I'm, quote, denying them income by discriminating in my choices of what I like to read. But we take that for granted. Uh, we certainly discriminate in the types of friendships we have as you were suggesting, the people we invite into our homes. Many on the left uh, accuse uh, people who present cases similar to ours. Uh, oh, you don't believe in anti-discrimination laws. Uh, you must believe in, 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 you must be a racist, or you must be someone who wants to be biased and exclude others. Well, I would just ask any of those people on the left who shout this, uh, how often do they invite conservatives or libertarians to a dinner party at their home uh, to say, oh, I'm trying to be inclusive. Okay, I'm trying to be inclusive and equitable. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have, well, how many conservatives are demographically in my community? Well, I want to be sure that we're we're balanced. So I'm going to see that at every dinner party or, or picnic I invite friends to, there's going to be a certain amount of conservatives, so many libertarians. So, so 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 many religious nuts. I, give me a break. We all discriminate. Uh, now the the issue is is that is it right for people to have this right to discriminate? And it would be hard for most people to say no. For example, we, we would we want the state to say you know we have to be apportioning uh, enough uh, people. Uh, to marry these single people. Do you want the state to decide who you have to marry? Oh, what what do you mean you only like brunettes? I'm sorry, uh, the brunette quota is filled. You're going to have to marry a blonde, a natural blonde, a natural redhead. Uh, you know, it, it just becomes absurd. We have likes and dislikes. Now, that doesn't mean we always agree with the likes and dislikes 
that we observe others use as a benchmark of making their choices and decisions, including interactive associations. Uh, I would consider uh, uh, viewing people of a different ethnicity or race as the sole criteria upon which you judge them as individuals to be absurd or on religion or even ideology. Uh, I uh, <laughs> I don't want to say some of my best friends, but I have friends who are hold political views significantly different than mine. But we have common interests, maybe hobbies, uh, experiences being of the same age group, uh, reminiscences of having gone through similar historical experiences. And you just pick and choose. Uh, one example, if I can just continue with this, Jacob, uh, like yourself, my wife and I have a dog. We go to the dog park. And uh, I, I, I have been easily able to find out that there are a lot of people who own dogs at the dog park who sh hold political views significantly, radically different than my own. Uh, but you know what? We like animals. We talk about how we care for them, how, how what, what food we give them, what kind of exercise we do, how long have you had your dog, where do you take them for your vet? You end up that, that there's an overlapping series of things that you share in common even though in a different arena of politics, you might not. So the idea that discrimination in itself is inappropriate, immoral, unjustifiable is absurd. We all discriminate in virtually everything we do to the extent that we pick one thing over another, even the mundane thing, what you're gonna pick as a meal off a restaurant menu is itself a discrimination. You're saying, I prefer this, as opposed to that, and I'm not going to eat this. I'm not going to pay for this. Now, the, the important thing also in this, if I can continue with this a bit, is the marketplace. It is very significant, as you were suggesting about the Old South, that if it was, quote, natural for the races to be separate, if it was natural for people of different ethnicities not to want to uh, interact in the marketplace, in personal relationships, in, in marital relationships, et cetera, et cetera, then why did South Africa have to impose apartheid laws? Why did the Southern states in the US following the Civil War and once the Northern armies had withdrawn, impose segregation laws? For the simple fact is that it was clear that unless you by state compulsion required a lack of interaction among people of different racial or ethnic groups, they would, they would. Why are you excluding certain uh, 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 African tribes living in South Africa from entering professions, occupations, uh, taking employment, unless the fact is they would have been, quote, white employees would have happily hired them and integrate them into their workplaces and their places of business. Why in the old South did you have to make it against the law for a black person to sit next to a white person at the lunch counter? If the owner, many owners would have said, you know, I'm just concerned with the color of their money, not the color of their skin. And I have clientele who, you know, maybe they like some people, maybe they don't like, but don't care who they sit next to. So why not make a buck serving both? But they had to use the power of the state, Jacob, the power of the state to separate them in this way. So the so the fact is, is that and as I was alluding to in that old article of mine from 1990, the first issue that we were doing with the publication uh, that you were alluding to uh, uh, racism in the market process is that when markets are free, ultimately the profit motive and economic opportunities and the costs of things act as both the incentives and the disincentives to ask yourself, is, am, am I making the right choices as a customer? Should I not buy the better and cheaper product just because it's sold by Joe and Joe goes to a different church than mine, has a different skin color than mine? So I, I'm going to have a lower standard of living by not buying his version of the product. Or you know what? I don't care if my market share is smaller. I don't care if my profits are reduced. I'm not going to hire Bill, even though Bill looks a little different than my other employees, even though he's much more productive and would significantly increase my profit margin because of his value added to my firm. Over the long run, 
The incentives of the market help overcome the biases and prejudices and discriminations that most of us in an enlightened way say, am I judging this person just by the way they look? Is he intelligent? Is he informed? Does he share other values like you? Do you have you had likes? Do you just like the same jokes? Sometimes you like to just be around people because you like the same jokes. I, I f f end, up ha end up in friendships just because I find people who like Rodney Dangerfield or, jo or Joan Rivers, okay? And we have common jokes. I mean, that happens. So the point is, is that the, it's the best avenue to help bring down barriers with the least resentment, uh, resistance, opposition, is without the state either forced segregating or forced integrating. And I'll just end with this last thing. There was a very, there was a rather well-known black conservative. Uh, he really was more of a classical liberal named George Schuyler in the middle decades of the 20th century. I've written an article about him. He, with wit, with, 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 with condescending ridicule, he would write articles, including H.L. Mencken's American Mercury, showing the absurdity of racial biases and discriminations, both in the North and the South of the 1920s and 1930s and so on. But you know what? When the civil rights movement emerged in the 1950s and 60s, even though he had been on the board of the NAACP, had had one of the most prominent and successful columns in a leading black newspaper in the United States, he became a non-person. And do you know why he became a non-person? Erased, canceled from the history of the civil rights movement and an anti-racist movement. Because in the 1950s and 60s, he said, I think these, these, these segregation laws should be abolished, but I'm against forced immigration, forced integration, forced integration. People should be free to form these associations themselves and to compel in one direction or another is as wrong as the old form was. And as a result, he got erased from the civil history of the civil rights movement and race issues of the 20th century, though he was brilliant, witty, insightful, knowledgeable, and a prominent figure of his time because he believed in freedom of choice. It doesn't change the fact that he was right, even though it resulted in the destruction of his professional journalistic career. All right. Well, you've raised a lot of good points. So let me let me double emphasize one point you made. I think it, it really is important. And that is the purpose of segregation laws. Mm -hmm. uh, that, as you point out, in the absence of segregation laws, people start integrating voluntarily. Not everybody. I mean, you, you, you have the bigots that are saying, no, we're not going to serve Blacks. And under principles of a freedom of association, they have that right. But the market poses a, imposes a penalty on those people. They start losing market share. Other people say, I don't want anything to do with your business. You know, you, you're not serving my black friends and I'm going elsewhere. So his profits start going down. His wife says, uh, how come I can't have a new car like everybody else? And his children have to go to college. So that nudges him to think, well, maybe I ought to give up my bigotry here. Uh, but as you point out, the reason you had they had to impose these segregation laws is that they knew that people were integrating on a voluntary basis. The segregation laws prohibited that process from going on. And that was partly what I was addressing in my article, uh, Racism Control in Rock and Roll. Is rock and Roll provides an example of that. You know, like in the movie, the Buddy Holly story, uh, they have that scene where Buddy Holly goes uh, to the, um, oh, I forget the name of that big theater in New York. Um, the Apollo Theater. The Apollo Theater, where uh, the, the manager there says, what are you doing here? And Buddy Holly says, you signed us up. He says, the Apollo Theater's never shown a white act because Buddy Holly sounded black. So he had never seen the, the Buddy Holly group and the crickets, and he thought they were black. So Buddy Holly says, well, just give me my uh, our money and we'll go. And, and the guy says, I'm not going to pay you for nothing. And then Buddy Holly says, well, we're here to perform. So they, they put Buddy Holly on, and the, the curtain opens up, and 
course, the Apollo Theater is all blacks, and there's this gasp from the audience because, oh my gosh, no white acts ever played the Apollo Theater. And uh, Buddy Holly says, we're just as surprised as y'all are. And he starts playing, and man, the audience just goes nuts. Everybody starts standing up and dancing in the aisles and stuff. And this was going on throughout the rock and roll era, that, that, that period. And so this is a classic example of why you needed segregation laws to keep this type of thing from happening. You, you made another good point that when those of us, particularly libertarians, call for the, the, the right of freedom of association, uh, people call us, oh, you're, you're a bigot, you're a racist, you're just advocating racism, which is pure nonsense. All we're doing is saying, no, we, people have a freedom of association and um, and that bigots have a right to be a bigot and the market will impose a penalty on the bigot. But I think it's also worth pointing out here, Richard, that these people that make this accusation uh, end up supporting many of the laws that are very discriminating. Like you take licensure laws, especially in the South and these licensure laws require monumental amounts of money to get the training and the certification and the licensing, you know, like five or six thousand dollars to be uh, licensed in uh, floral arrangements or or uh, braiding hair. And this is these licensing laws are really just the modern day Jim Crow. Now, why did Jim Crow laws come into in place? Well, because blacks were out competing whites. And so they need these laws to protect um, the whites from this competition. And licensure laws are a classic example of this. And yet these people that say, oh, y'all are bigots because you're calling for freedom of association, support these licensure laws that lock out of the labor market blacks. And I have no doubts, especially in the South, that these licensure laws, that this is one of the real purposes of these licensure laws is to prevent blacks from competing against whites. They're, they're the new modern day Jim Crow. Another Jim Crow is the drug war. Uh, Michelle Alexander, the, the black academician, she's written a book on this called The New Jim Crow, where the everybody understands that blacks receive disproportionately higher jail sentences than whites. More arrests, more uh, stops, searches, pat down searches, higher jail sentences. Uh, and yet these people that look at us, you know, oh, you libertarians are bigots or whatever because you call for freedom of association. They support the drug war which really is institutionalized racism. They say, oh, there's no structural racism in America. Nonsense. Look at the drug war. So when you look at these kind of things, you realize, hey, the real solution to this is freedom in the free markets. And let me, let me wrap up this part by referring to the, the, the Baker situation with respect to uh, people, uh, gays or same-sex people or whoever. Uh, that, you know, the, the argument's always made, Richard, oh, well, you know, freedom of association, freedom of speech and all this has those rights have nothing to do with this controversy. This is a business, a bake shop. Bakery is a privately owned business as a private establishment. As I said earlier in this this show, people have a right to decide how to run their private establishment, just like they have a right to to run their homes. And if they don't want to sell to a same-sex couple or bake a cake for a same-sex couple or whoever else, Catholics, Blacks, whites, that's their right because it's their business. It's their privately owned business. It has nothing to do with freedom of speech or um, First Amendment, freedom of religion, and so forth. It has everything to do with the rights of private property. Yeah, if I can use a couple of examples on the the power of individuals to influence things. Um, I assume every viewer and listener has heard of Frank Sinatra. Well, Frank Sinatra regularly performed in Las Vegas, but it was notorious into the 1950s, in fact, the early 1960s, that Black performers like Ella Fitzgerald or Sammy Davis Jr. would perform at the Las Vegas hotels, but they were discriminated against that they wouldn't be allowed to stay at the very hotel where they were performing that generated the revenue from people who wanted to see their acts. Frank Sinatra said, oh, I'm performing at this hotel, but so is Sammy Davis Jr. or Ella Fitzgerald. Well, I'm not going to perform at your hotel anymore if you discriminate against them. If they perform in your hotel, I expect that you have the courtesy and the decency to assign them free of charge like you do for me 
a good quality room as a special guest. Otherwise, I walk with them. That started breaking down those types of discriminations uh, in, 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 in Las Vegas in a big way. One person's influence. But, you know, money talks. You want me to perform? I'm the big draw. That you see that you treat these other performance, performers with the same courtesy and politeness and respect that you treat me. And it worked. It worked. It helped to break down those racial discriminations at the Las Vegas hotels. And that's important to remember those things. It really is because it shows you that you don't need integration laws to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. And that's a more harmonious society, a peaceful society. It's, it's that you're nudging people in the right direction rather than using the blunt force of coercion. You see, it, there's this notion that if government will just force people to do the right thing, that people will change their ways. Well, that's pure nonsense. You're not going to change a bigot by, by using the brunt force of government coercion and threatening him with jail time or fines mm -hmm. or whatever. He's not going to change inside of him. And in, in my hunch, Richard, is that with these laws, these integration laws, mm -hmm. that what they really did was put like a cap on a steam cooker mm -hmm. where it, the, the, the pressure just keeps building and building and building um, uh, among the, the, the bigoted classes in society until finally it just explodes while in a free market they'd be able to vent their feelings it, mm -hmm. it would be coming out and people would know hey that store doesn't serve blacks or jews or whatever but then what would happen as you point out people start ostracizing that business hey you don't sell to my friends i ain't coming to your business and that guy then starts oh well what should i do and whatever uh, another example is the business that discriminates against, against black employees that he says, OK, here's here's a black that's willing to work at, let's say, seven dollars an hour. Here's a white guy that's charging fifteen dollars an hour. Same job. OK, so the, the bigot employer says, oh, I don't like blacks. I'm going to hire that white guy. <laughs> what does that mean? That means less profits. He's paying more than he has to. His competitor down the street, it says, I got nothing Vince, against hiring blacks. And all of a sudden, he's pulling in more customers. He's getting more uh, profit. That nudges the guy into the proper behavior, just like your example in Vegas, where people said, man, if, we're, if this goes on, we're never going to get Sinatra or any other white act here. We got to change our ways. And that's the beauty of the market process as compared to blunt force of coercion laws, mandates, and so forth. Look, and just, you see one more example from the entertainment industry. This was back in 1939, 1940. So Gone with the Wind comes out, the famous movie, Clark Gable, Janet Lee, uh, Vivian Lee, excuse me, Vivian Lee. And so now there's the Academy Awards. Well, black entertainers were virtually never invited as guests to go to those Academy Award ceremonies. And one of the lead members of the Gone of Willing category, I'm blanking out on her name, is 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 the house slave in 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 Vivian Lee's estate, this this rather fat woman, if you've ever seen the movie. She she was excellent in the movie. She was brilliant in the movie. She was not given an, an invitation to attend that Academy Award ceremony. Clark Gable told the Academy Award Association if she doesn't get invited with a normal seat like everyone else, I don't show up. And if I am awarded the Academy Award for Best Actor for Gone with the Wind, then I won't be on stage to accept it. Guess what? She got her invitation to the Academy Award ceremony. One person can make a difference. That's awesome. Well, just like Rosa Parks made a difference. One yes. person you know, saying, no, I ain't going to sit at the back of the bus. Correct. And that and that was the course right. against government discrimination um, there in the South. Mm -hmm. So yeah, one person can make a difference. And the, the important thing is that, that we keep emphasizing the importance of principles here, the principles of private property, freedom of association, and the rights and liberties that make up a genuinely free society. All right, Richard, on that note, we'll wrap things up. Enjoyed the conversation as always. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, again, come to FFF.org, subscribe to our FFF daily. And uh, Richard, I enjoyed the conversation. Look forward to talking to you next week. Until next week. Mm -hmm.